Welcome to the Fierce Planet Adventures podcast, where we share adventures across the five mountains of human development. Today's guest, Jeff Grant, is a coach, author, and ultra endurance athlete. He's passionate about helping people overcome adversity and tap into their flow state performance zone. Jeff has written five books on mind training and running. In 26 plus years of ultra endurance sports, he has completed and coached athletes to finish some of the toughest events on the planet, including desert and mountain ultra marathons, Ironman triathlons, seal fit Kokoro, long distance open water swims, and kayak adventures. These events have spanned the extremes of heat, cold, sleep deprivation, and stress. Jeff lives in Zurich, Switzerland, and he enjoys swimming in lakes year round even when that means cutting into the ice to get in. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. We're honored to have you on. And uh, we typically like to start things off by asking what you're grateful for today. Oh, wow. Can we talk the whole time about this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I am... I'm so grateful to be alive, so grateful to be helpful, and so grateful to be around uh, the kind of energy that the people that just is uplifting. I worked so many years of my life in a in a corporate setting, which is not a not a bad thing, um, but there was always a nagging voice like work with the people, work with people, try to support people, uh, and then once I made a shift and got to do that for a living. Then I thought, this is this is living the dream. There's such uh, amazing energy that comes with it. Who you connect with in that space, and uh, yeah, and for that, I'm I'm super grateful. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Jeff. So wow, right? I mean, I'm looking at your bio, getting out there, getting it done, living it, and uh, I'm curious. Is we just love to hear people's stories of how you know their their transition through life and the pivot point. So can you walk us through? the change from a sedentary lifestyle from an IT professional to an ultra endurance athlete? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I stormed into my 20s uh, with a degree in IT, uh, super fired up back in the 90s uh, for work uh, and to earn a living. And I was doing nothing in sport, nothing in fitness. And I was eating terrible, terrible foods, uh, drinking too much beer, eating too much you know, cheesy nacho things, whatever, and doing everything wrong. Um, and I got old very quickly. I think from 21 to 24 or so, I think I aged 20 years in what I was doing to my body. And uh, I started noticing it, you know, back problems, issues with energy, lots of problems that you shouldn't have when you're in your mid twenties. You shouldn't have in your mid forties or your mid fifties, but definitely not in your, in your mid twenties. Um, and, and I reached a point, I uh, had some family members who gave me a great nudge, just the right amount of nudge, uh, and I wanted to do something different. And there were a, a couple New Year's resolutions that just didn't happen. I would buy the running shoes, I would buy some dumbbells or something, and it wouldn't happen. And then I watched the Ironman triathlon in Hawaii, uh, saw it on TV, and I saw these incredibly fit people, and they looked happy. And I said, ah, I, I want that. Whatever that is, I want that. So I signed up for an Ironman. This is back in the 90s. You could actually sign up and get in these things and uh, without having to get in lotteries. And I signed up uh, and I gave myself just under a year to do it. And then I had to figure out what it meant. And that meant running three miles for the first time to figure out what that meant because I needed to run 26 in an Ironman. Uh, and it meant discovering this whole sport of triathlon, which was way over my head from where my fitness was then. Um, so it started with a goal to do a race to reach what looked like a, a fit, happy state, to be like the fit and happy people. And, uh, and then I fell in love with the lifestyle. Like the race was great. It was a good goal. But I, after I finished the first Ironman, I wanted to do more. I wanted to be around these kind of energized people. Um, and then, you know, it's one step leads to another. And then it's it's ultra marathoning, it's mountaineering expeditions, and then you just kind of fall in love with with the energy that that lifestyle brings. Great, thanks. Um, one thing that you mentioned there, how did you literally go from sitting on a couch watching the Iron Man to getting to Hawaii, getting to Kona, and and perform participating in it? 
obviously you don't go from zero to hero in like that, right? There's a process that you had to define. Could you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, a couple parts of that. First, to, to get to Kona it took four years. To, to get to the, which was still a dream to get to, to go race in Kona, um, to do the first Ironman triathlon took a year. And, you know, that I made mistakes. And at the very beginning, I didn't work with coaches, which, which is something, if I look back, that, that would have been a smart thing to do back then, especially since I went into that profession. Uh, I, I value the importance of it more now. Um, so I talked to people who did it. I asked tons of questions. I made so many mistakes. I had terrible running technique at the beginning. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing, yet I didn't want to stop. I think once I started, I realized if I stopped then, and this was a theme that showed up uh, later in my life, I felt like if, if you decide you're going to change and then you give up on that, then you've given up on everything. And, and so I didn't want to take the step back. And that was a driving force to just keep stepping forward, keep making the mistakes, fail forward fast, mm -hmm. do whatever it takes to reach a new level of understanding to keep the story going instead of taking the three steps back. Failure, you know, in our society, I think across the world, it, it has a very negative connotation, right? People look at it as an endpoint and not a transition to learning and in, in moving forward and in, in, in to keep going. What was your mindset or what's your mindset around re reframing failure? Yes, super tough one. Um, if I think back to what felt like one of my biggest failures as an athlete, uh, I set a, a, a race, uh, another Ironman race, and I needed to finish it in a certain time. It was a very important goal. For a year, that number meant everything. I visualized that number. Now, I'm not winning these races. I'm like a solid middle of the pack or maybe a little bit toward the front of the pack some of the years, but never in the front front of the race and never on a podium. Uh, but I set this goal and I failed at that goal and I finished the race. I missed it by six minutes and I dropped my knees and I'd laid there feeling sorry for myself for probably two hours at the end of this race because I was a failure. I failed at this goal. Uh, and then I, I started reflecting as I laid there, just looking up at the sky, I was reflecting on uh, that entire race. I raced my heart out. I really gave it everything. It was an unusually hot day. It was a windy day. The conditions of the day didn't care about the number goal. And I look back, it, that was 15 plus years ago. The numbers don't matter anymore. What, what mattered to me was I put it all on the line. I gave it my best. And in the end, it was actually a huge success because the, what was important was, could I commit to giving my best for, for you know, a long, long race and never making excuses during the race? And that's what happened. And that was a better lesson I could take from the rest you know, and use for the rest of my life than if the conditions had been easy and I, had, I, I beat my time by five minutes, that would mean nothing to me now. So it's, it's, the, it's the dark moments, the moments of failure, the moments where you feel so low and you pick yourself up. Those are the ones that teach the lessons. Those are the ones that you remember and take with you the rest of your life and that hopefully, hopefully help you power through harder things later. Tell us a little bit about the mind training that you feel went into that before you actually got to the point of being able to accept these failures as change or uh, opportunities. Yeah. yeah interesting because um and i say interesting because if i think of some of the, the biggest examples it was before i had any sense of mind training so i think it was only later it's only after the story i told you was before i was really i, I I've, I've always loved yoga i've loved meditation but i wasn't really applying any kind of structured approach and i wasn't connecting the dots with that kind of mind training work in sports so a lot of the early failures happened there was a moment of reflection after it happened, contemplation, and it was out of those moments that came tools that I would later use for myself and later use for coaching. And then it became easier when a failure showed up in the future or a real a low point arrived, it was easier to reframe it as, ah, ah, this is good. This is good that a low point's here because it's a chance to, to grow. It's a chance to tap into something different. It's a chance to uh, test a new mind tool and see how this mind tool works. Do you, okay. Speaking of mind tools, 
um, and maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but uh, when you're out doing an ultra race um, across the desert, it's hot, it's unforgiving, you've got sand everywhere, you know, and and there's just, it's just, there's no stopping, right? It's relentless. And, and that's, what is it, what flip or switch can you flip? What do you tell yourself in your, in your mind when you have, when you've reached that, that this sucks moment and yeah. you're like, man, I, you know, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Um, I, I'm just, I'm curious as to what, what goes on and what, what you technique you use. I love that you said the magic word, flipping the switch. And I, I love it. It's it's not that easy, and it's something that's different for everyone. And I, I'd like to connect. I want to say something about the desert, but I want to start in Manhattan first. And we're going to use New York City as an example for flipping a switch. So the New York City Marathon is an amazing party. The energy of the city is incredible. There's nothing like it. Um, and there's part of it, though, that gets lonely. So you're leaving Brooklyn, you're running back into Manhattan, uh, and, and things get quiet when you're going over the bridge. It, it feels like you're going up a mountain as you go over the bridge. And you come into Manhattan, and there's, I don't know, 2 million people. There's People are screaming on First Avenue when you come in. So you, you have this moment where you're down, and then you come into the madness and excitement of New York City. And that just lifts you. I get chills thinking about it. And it was 20 years ago when I, when I did this. Um, so that is a magical moment where the, the, the switch is flipped for you because the environment changes for you. So I, I had this experience in New York. And then a couple of years later, I'm running a marathon on Kiowa Island. Very quiet marathon, beautiful marathon, but very quiet. And I hit the wall, complete low point started feeling sorry for myself. It's the normal thing. Started making excuses. Oh, this was, I didn't train enough. I was sick last week, blah, blah, blah. This voice in the head starts, inner critic. And I looked up and what I wanted in this moment was Manhattan. I wanted 2 million people screaming, screaming as I came into the city. Instead, I looked at this, this uh, older gentleman watering his lawn, wearing sandals and black socks pulled up to his knees. And he just, he's looking at the water hose and he looks up at me and he looks down. There was no smile. There was no, you got it, good job. There was nothing there. And I realized I wanted something. I wanted him to smile. I was looking outside for something to give me a feeling of what it was like in New York to be that, that uh, trigger to lift my spirits again. I realized in that moment, there's a lesson. If it's not there for you, if you're just relying on the external world to give it to you, you've got to go inside. There has to be something, a way you can flip the switch inside and create that energy of screaming fans, screaming New Yorkers supporting the marathon. Years later, I'm running in the Sahara, a very lonely place to run a very lonely place to race, a beautiful race called the Marathon de Sabla. If you love the desert and mountains that you find in the desert, it's a beautiful place to be, but it can be a very lonely place. Uh, and I was having a very good performance uh, on this one day, probably the best running experience of my life on a 50 mile stage. Uh, I was in, in the a lead group of runners and I couldn't see people in front or behind me, really at the, the tip of the spear in this race, uh, which was a blessing to find myself in this place. Um, and I needed to power through the last couple hours to keep up a ridiculous pace that was well above the limits of, of what I thought I had. And I would have been running a pace of a great marathon, and this was a double marathon in, in the desert heat. So how do you sustain it? How do you keep going when there's nobody out cheering for you? There's no external energy. Um, and in that moment, I said, well, I, I have to create what I want. And what I want right now is all of my friends and all of my family in the desert running with me. So I built this, this visualization, not a hallucination. I, those have happened too, but this was a pure visualization in the desert, running, sweating, the heat is there. I saw my best friend in front of me and he's blocking the wind. It's like a Peloton in cycling. He's blocking the heat, he's blocking the wind. And then I see my friends on one side, my family on another, and they've, they've formed this protective shell and I got to keep up. And my buddy's looking back. He's like, come on, man, stay on me, stay on me, stay on me. And I see everyone suffering for me. And they're suffering so I can have this race finish. And this goes on for, I don't know, an hour or two 
on this stage running across the desert. And eventually I see the finish line and one by one they peel off. My best friend leaves me at the very end and he's like, go finish it, finish it. Boom, cross the finish line. I was shocked at the time they came up. They needed to check my equipment to make sure I wasn't cheating. I didn't break any rules because I was way faster than I ever should have been. And so much of that had to do with the power of a visualization, of bringing this group energy, this family, friends, whoever you want to sacrifice for because they're sacrificing for you, whoever you want to honor, you tap into that and that helps bring you into a flow state. And when you're in a flow state, then you actually exceed the limits that you ever thought were possible physically. Wow, that's really powerful. Um... To, that, that, there's there's a lot to unpack there, right? And I, I think it, it might benefit our listeners if you could talk a little bit more about visualization and what that really is, because I think you you alluded to this earlier. It's it's not a daydream. It's not a hallucination. It's something that you actively work at to create in your mind, setting up success. And hopefully, I just didn't take your thunder there, but. Um, no, I, you I like actually to, gave a, yeah. I liked, I just love to hear your, th your thoughts on that. You, you offered a, a, a really nice segue as well, because uh, visualizing success is, is a great tool, a powerful tool. Um, and it's a great tool as even a first step in visualization. So if you're about to do public speaking and you visualize yourself confidently talking in front of a group, you're creating a film in your mind. And maybe that film is just a static image of you standing up with confidence in front of a group. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a film where you can actually see yourself engaging, making eye contact, feeling energized, remembering your points, that kind of thing. Um, so I love success-based visualizations. Just taking a moment, close your eyes and see yourself living that, living that performance that you want. The next level though, is see things go wrong. So visualize yourself giving a talk and forgetting, forgetting something, forgetting where you're supposed to go with the story. Um, as an athlete, visualize yourself suffering, visualize the, the lowest moment, see yourself under maximum adversity, and then see yourself power through it. So I like to go to the dark place. And when I coach athletes, I say, we're going to go there. In your mind, you need to go to the moment where you want to quit and where that voice is overwhelmingly powerful telling you, quit. This was the wrong year. Quit because your family needs you home. You don't need to, like you think of a thousand reasons to quit. So go there. We're going to live that story in your mind in a visualization so you're familiar with what it's like. But see yourself there and see the switch. See the look in your eye when you say, I'm going to finish this. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to pick myself up. I'm going to get out of this hole. I'm going to climb out of it, and I'm going to power through. And maybe that moment is because you think of someone you want to honor. Maybe you think of a friend or a family member, and that's, that's what works for you to say, that's it. Maybe you look at your 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 swim buddy or whoever your workout partner is or the partner in this adventure, and you do it for them. Or maybe you think about your old self that you left behind or your new self that you want. And these are the little things. It's, it's worth spending the time before you need the skill to go there and practice it because then it's familiar to you. So when it is cold and dark and miserable and whatever's happening and the, the voices, the inner critic voice is happening in your mind, it's like, oh, okay, I expected you. Good to see you. You're here. I've been in this situation before in my mind. I've seen myself go to the low point and I've seen myself tap into something, flip that switch and dig myself out of it. Yeah, I, I'm probably going to get this, this quote or, or this, this statement a little bit wrong here. But what, what struck me is, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't rise to the, to the level of our training. We, we fall to the level of our training when when crisis happens, you know, we don't rise to the level of our expectations, we follow the level of our training. And what I hear you saying there, Jeff, is that 
preparing your mind ahead of time to to what's the worst case scenario or what's that really what what, what are dirt diving what the different challenges mental challenges may be for you along your your journey of of the ultra race or the mountaineering trip and planning ahead for those things and when you visualize it you set it in your mind and in your body to some degree mm-hmm. um and that's i mean that that's kind of like okay so now it, it sucks i want to give up oh wait a minute i know what that feels like i know i'm doing this uh, not an option let's keep on moving um a little while ago, you talked about flow state. And I want to put a pin on that because I want to really come back and dive into that. But, um, you know, you, we both lived in Colorado or all three of us lived in Colorado for a while. And, and I presume you've done a bunch of 14, 14ers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, same with us. That's one of our passions. And early on, the, the first couple that I did, um, there, was, there was a couple things that stood out to me in retrospect. And, and one is... Um, uh, false summits. And, um, you know, as being a newbie to it, to the whole thing is, wow, there it is. I'm almost there. Oh, shit. <laughs> I got to go another, you know, three quarters of a mile and another 800 uh-huh. feet of elevation gain. Um, and that's actually a really good, I think a really good metaphor for life is throughout life, whether it's the the challenges we undertake um, the relationships we're involved in, the career choices we make, there's always going to be these, oh, wow, I think I've made it moments. And then something's going to come along and, and, and slap you across the face and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're not quite there yet. Um, so I think that mountaineering to some degree is, is a great metaphor for life itself, right? Embracing the suck. And I'm, I'm just curious as, as to what goes on, you know, what's your experience with those embrace the suck moments, right? When you get to that point where like, damn, I thought I was just about there and now I'm not. And, you know, we already talked about, you know, dirt diving, the, the give up moments, but you know, what, what happens or what, what do you think about when you're almost there, but you hit a false summit or, you know, it's just, it could be on the grinder P doing grinder PT at seal fit, right. Is, yeah. you know, you're, you got to do more, more log, you know, more, more logs. Um, what, what, what do you do? How do you trip that trigger? That's, it, it's easier now to look back. It, it, and, and if you've done lots of, lots of hard things, if you've done mountaineering, if you've done seal fit Kokoro or uh, ultra marathons, you, you can go back and kind of map it. So uh, you can connect the dots, famous quote about, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Um, so it's much easier to do and say, oh yeah, the, the low moments were actually the peak moments. But for all the years that I would, I coached at Kokoro and Seal Fit Academies, I would tell the guys when they would come into the program, um, your lowest moment is the one that's going to stay with you for the next 10 years. That if someone asks you about, for example, Kokoro and, and what do you remember the most? Yeah, guys may say, yeah, we remember when it was secured. But the, the, the moments when it was easy and it was the sun came out and you were warm, those kind of fade. But the, the moments of suffering with your brothers, with your sisters, with your, you know, with your boat crew, with the whole class, those are the moments that actually show you something about yourself and about humanity and about supporting each other. Those are the ones that mean something later. Now, if it's your first time doing something like that, you don't really know it until you're in it and some time has gone by and you're actually reflecting back. So I offer it just as as a sage advice to keep in mind that um, even in mountaineering, you could get to a summit that was an easy walk up. Ah, It was a five hour walk, got to the top, weather was beautiful, took some pictures, sat in the sun, you know, and then then walked down the mountain and had a pizza. Who remembers that day? No, you remember the day that was just terrible. It was too cold. It was windy. Something happened and you got lost. And these are the stories that, that inspire you and, and, and excite you. And these are the ones that, that really stay with us. Um, I, was, I, I loved mountaineering in Colorado. I started climbing some other mountains around the world. Ended up in the Andes on Aconcagua. And Aconcagua, a really high mountain, highest in the Americas. Um, it can be a walk up. 
it's a high walk up, but it can be it can be a hike up that's not that technical. Uh, I got unlucky and we got nailed with a big storm and we spent four days in a tent above 19,000 feet um, and never made the summit. Yet that, that experience touched me. I spent three weeks in Argentina to climb this mountain, didn't go to the top, didn't get the nice summit photo, can't say I ever climbed that mountain, but I learned more about myself, about how people support each other uh, from that moment, that, that terrible four days in a storm uh, than I would have had it been easy. So the, the, what I try to offer is um, it's all how you frame it in your mind. And when those really tough moments arrive, if you know that when the tough moment comes, that's the juicy part, that's why you're there. You're not there for the easy stuff, you're there for the, the hard stuff. That's the thing that you want and you want to be able to take with you the rest of your life. So those are the moments that are actually a gift. It's, it's flipping it. You think that's the punishment moment, those are actually the gift moments. The other moments are just, yeah, makes you smile in the moment, but you're not going to remember it. Yeah. Um, I've often said that uh, the mountaineering is, is about suffering and, and being okay with suffering <laughs> to get, to get to that moment of, wow, this is just amazing. Um, and, and there's just nothing quite like whether you summit or not, being at altitude and looking out across the mountains, across the land, and just seeing the immense beauty. Yeah. And it just touches your soul. Um, so if I can offer, mm -hmm. I, I, if I, just to offer one thing as a practical thing to do in that setting, I'm talking about looking back and how you frame things. And, and sometimes in the moment of execution, that's, that's a lot to ask. Like in the moment of suffering, to be able to have that kind of perspective, even if you get it, it's hard to have it in that moment. Often in the moment, the best thing you can do is one, breathe, so take the deep breath, do the box breathing. Uh, that's the, definitely to take care of yourself. The second thing is do something to be of service to others. So in, in, the, in the deepest moment of suffering, if you can look at someone else, even if you don't have the energy, like, I love this. I love looking at someone when I'm beat. And I'm like, you got this, come on, you got this, you know, or, or just do something to help them or give them some water, do something to get out of your own head and something to help someone else, even if they're not suffering as much as you think you are. That's, that's very often enough to kind of get through that little, that low moment where everything seems so dark. Yeah, being focused on others, taking your attention off of yourself and, and pointing on, on your teammates um that's leadership right that's that's true leadership i think um so english channel normandy d-day um challenge what was that like this this was called the epic or the um epic charity challenge and we did it for the 74th anniversary of d-day uh, as a fundraiser for the navy seal museum uh, an amazing experience. I felt like I was in uh, uh, in a in hollowed in a hollowed space in a hollowed a uh, area, hollowed <laughs> hollowed area. <laughs> and uh, this the history there was was uh, just incredible. And I was with a team that, um, yeah, I was honored to be in this whole place to do some good for the world and to challenge ourselves. And uh, the idea was we would swim 10 kilometers in the English Channel. The French Coast Guard would take us out 10 kilometers offshore. Um, we would swim into Omaha Beach, and then we would ruck to St. Lo. And it was a 26-mile ruck. So beautiful uh, thing to do as a, um, yeah, to, to honor D-Day. Uh, and I trained all winter, swam in Swiss lakes all winter, did swam in temperatures I never thought was possible, swam distances I'd never done before. Even though I'd done Ironman triathlons, I'd never swam over five kilometers. Um, point is, I tried to use all the tools for a couple dec from a couple decades of uh, endurance sports to prepare for a very long, hard swim in the English Channel, cold swim. Uh, and then the rug part I just thought would be fun. So training for a certain adversity, but the adversity we got wasn't the adversity we trained for. So on the day of the swim, there was a massive storm at sea and the Coast Guard refuses to take us out. And so they're supposed to take us, you know, six miles offshore, drop 30 guys in the water. And, uh, and, and they're like, no, 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 we're not gonna go. 
huge discussion. In the end, they decide they're going to take us, but they, they're going to bring less support boats. So they take us. It takes an hour to get to the start line. We're sitting in these little boats. It's like I, 10 of us on the back of a, I don't, I don't know what kind of boat this is, but not a boat for 10 people just to be sitting on the back of these little Coast Guard boats. Um, we're getting seasick just getting to the start. And then they give us instructions. And in our group, many language, languages were spoken, except for the most important one for that outing, and that was French. I think we probably had six or eight languages in the group, but no one could speak French enough. So there was some confusion with the Coast Guard on how things would be managed. And um, we're all looking at the water and thinking, this is nuts. I mean, six miles offshore, you see nothing. It's gray, there's big swells everywhere. You know, we had an agreement that you would stay near your swim buddy, but in those kind of conditions, it's, it's almost impossible unless you're roped together. Uh, so we get to the point and they say, okay, this is it, jump in. And we jump in and we start swimming. And I'm looking at my Garmin and we're, we're moving. We're really moving fast. I'm, I'm blown away seeing how fast the kilometers are, are clicking off here. And they said, if anybody got a kilometer off the back from the front boat that we're supposed to be following, then they, they would, you get picked up and they would take you once to the front. And if you got back behind again, you get pulled out. And there are some very elite swimmers, mostly uh, retired SEALs in this group, uh, an amazing group of athletes. Um, and I just said, I have to keep up with these guys. Don't, don't get pulled out of the water. And we're, you can barely see your buddy. You can't see the boats, difficult conditions. About an hour into it, the boat comes up next to the group I'm in and says, get in. We're all like, nobody in this group is a quitter. No one wants to quit. Uh, and everyone's arguing and they're like, the Coast Guard says, no, it's, it's too dangerous. We're pulling you out. We're all very disappointed. They pull us out and they do a head count and they think someone's missing. And it's a big confusion. No one's missing, but we don't know this in the moment. So we're sitting on these boats as they're on the radio. This goes on for over an hour. So with wetsuits, once the water drains out, there's no warmth. Mm -hmm. So now everyone is getting like shaky hypothermic. And the worst, the boats are just rocking side to side. <laughs> so everyone, no one wants to be the first person to get sick because then everyone's going to be throwing up. And uh, <laughs> so what happens? Everyone gets sick, including the Coast Guard. Those, we're, all, we're all just a mess in these little boats. Um, and this goes on for an hour. No one knows if a buddy's lost. We're all counting and like no one on your boat's lost, but what's happening on the other boats? And it's very difficult to have communications, what's, what's happening. Um, and for a commemoration for D-Day, this was perfect because we weren't getting shot at. We're just athletes at doing a fundraiser. Like what we were doing was, was just an easy, an easy little thing to, to, to raise some money to push ourselves. And, uh, but we weren't at war. But I felt like we were getting a tiny taste of the misery that the soldiers had on D-Day before they even went into the hell of war. Just to get across the channel, they were wet, they were cold, they were confused, they didn't know where they were, they were seasick. And I thought this was good. Like I could see them looking down on us saying, we just wanted to give you a tiny, tiny taste uh, of some of the suffering. Um, and the adversity we had to keep our spirits up and everyone just wanted to fight like by getting in the water. It's like, get in and let's swim. And um, in the end, we realized that, that no one was missing, thankfully. And the Coast Guard said, we're taking you back to Harbor. And, and the group said, no, we're swimming. Another huge debate. Eventually they let us back in the water. We learned that no one accounted for the currents. So when they dropped us in, we were way off course. So they actually, it was a great thing that they picked us up and repositioned us so we could swim in the direction that the wind was blowing us back to shore. Um, we arrived on the beach and we had no idea where we were. We weren't at the target. We had been blown again. We didn't go, know if we were going left or right. So there were so many, like the, the, the universe was, was giving us so many little lessons and moments and tiny little tastes of what we were really there for that made everything very special. So this to me, this was a gift. Had it been an easy swim, yay, we swim three or four hours, we arrive at the beach, people clap. We, what would that have taught? What, what, what could we have gotten out of that in life? But the fact that we all were confused, was someone missing, we all got sick together, we all suffered and shivered together. Um, we had the confusion of not knowing where we were actually landing when we reached shore. 
this this is what made it a special experience and, and something unforgettable for us all. Several words come to mind. Um, flexibility, resiliency, mental toughness, um, adaptability. Uh, those are all words that, that came to mind as you're telling me that story. So thank you. Um, that, that's, that's amazing. And uh, wow, good stuff. Um, so Hillseeker, tell us about Hillseeker. Yeah, so uh, my my coaching company, uh, that w when I decided to work full time in the coaching business, and I, I worked in a corporate career before, my heart was in sports, my heart was in uh, in coaching and helping lift other people up. Um, and then I decided to build a, a coaching business. Uh, and at the time, Hill Seeker was my wife's nickname because she loved biking hills from Colorado, uh, loved, loved biking up mountains and, and with that spirit of if you have a choice between flat and the hill, you take the hill because it's going to be way more interesting whatever happens on the hill. Uh, so then I, I took that and, and used that to just create the, the feeling and, uh, and the theme of a coaching business. Nice. So love the name. <laughs> um, you've taken your experiences, your lessons, the lessons that you've learned through your um, ultra distance or long distance marathons. Um, and now you're coaching others and you've written several books. Um, and I, I guess, you know, w one of the things that comes up for me is, is just trying to envision or put myself in those long distance situations. And, and the closest I can come to is when I've watched maybe the Eco Challenge or Primal Quest, um, and you know, one thing that they kind of struck me is interesting um, and sometimes kind of funny is it seems like there's a consistent theme of um, of these athletes at some point in the race hallucinating, and um, you know, they're just like they're, they're just kind of out of. Some of them are out of it. Some of them are coherent, but they're seeing things that just aren't there. Um, has that ever happened to you? Oh, I have two quick stories on this. The, the first was my math genius story. Uh, ultra, uh, ultra Trail du Mont Blanc had been racing for you know, over 30 hours at some point. And, uh, and I, I just couldn't stay awake. I was falling asleep walking and would like shake myself and have to get back on the trail. And um, so I thought, okay, I, what I need is I need to do, I need to think. I need to do something with my mind. So I'm, I'm going to do math. I was like, okay, 12 times 10, it's like 120. 12 times 12, 144. Okay, that's too easy. Uh, 138 times 342. Oh, it's 14,794. It's like, wow. Okay, it has to be harder. 1,343 times 10,949. Okay, that's 10,743,213. Like, I, I was like, you're a genius. I was like, this is amazing. In this state, I can solve any math problem. And then I, this woke me up enough to realize I'm just saying numbers. N none of those answers, like the, the first two were right, but the rest, I was just quickly able to give a number that seemed plausible. And but that made me laugh. And that woke me up for the next half an hour. And it's funny because sometimes a little thing can kind of flip the switch and get you out of a, a funk or whatever pattern you're in, especially when you're hallucinating like that. But the best, the best one was, um, it, it's a great feeling in, in training or an event to go through a night. And I know at Seal Fit Kokoro, we would have everyone wave goodbye to the sun when the sun's setting the first time, you know, bye sun. And it's, it's best from a coach's perspective, it's best if they're already cold. Like if everyone's in the ocean, they get out, they're shivering, and then you, you watch the sun go down. That's a real mind trip to see that. A great thing to work on. And then the sun comes up in the morning and you say, hi, sun. It's that second night, though, when you're saying bye to the sun again in an event. That's when things get really special because usually hallucinations really kick in on the second, third night awake. Then things get special. So I had made it through my second night uh, in the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc. This is a race, 104 miles or so in the Alps. You go up and down mountains all the time. You run over 20 something thousand, almost 30,000 feet up in the end. So you're just up and down, up and down. The, the sun has come up 
hi sun for the second time. I'm so happy with this. But I really feel drugged. I can't even say drunk. It's, it's a drugged feeling as I'm just trying to stay on the trail. And suddenly I stop because the trail is, is covered in the whole forest in, in sausages. As we would say here in, in Switzerland, bratwurst, bratwurst, like sausages everywhere, thousands. And I stop and I look down at the, at the sausages and my mind is trying to figure out why are there sausages here in the middle of this mountain trail? And, and, I'm, and so then I have to solve the problems. I've stopped running now. You know, I'm, I'm almost 40 hours into a race. I, I can see the valley where it finishes but I'm perplexed because my trail suddenly is covered in sausages. And I'm, and I'm thinking, what happened? How did this happen? And then my mind has, it, it, this is the, the, the mind when you're hallucinating, it's kind of there and kind of not there. So it's trying to work the problem. So then I, I decide it must've been, they were flying in, flying them obviously from Germany somewhere, the, the, the airplane came over. And then I was imagining the guy, like the, like the strap is there and the big shipment of sausage is shaking. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. And the strap breaks. And then the plane, the back door opens and the, the sausages like land in the, this, this, is, this has to be what happened. And I'm seeing this whole thing in my mind, like how they fall through the air. And I'm the first guy who's arrived on the, at the sausage accident. And then my mind's like, no, that makes, that's really, really, like that makes no sense. Why would that, that wouldn't, they wouldn't fall out of an airplane like that. So then I, I go one layer closer to what I think is reality. And it's, they must've been smuggled. Like we're not far from the Italian border. So maybe there's like a, a cartel or a mafia that's, that's smuggling like from Germany through Switzerland to Italy. And like, I'm imagining these guys with these giant rucksacks and they're like, the, the police, police. And they drop their rucksacks and the sausages are sp and they take off running. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, well, that, that like a, a sausage cartel, like, is this, I don't really, I don't think the mafia is into sausage. This doesn't make sense either. And then I think, okay, I know what I should have done all along. I have to just pick one up. Like, I have to see what, what is this? And is it hot? Like, was it cooked? Was it frozen? Like maybe this will help me solve. So I've been down. I, I would. I wish I had a video of this. I've been down and I and I pick this this thing up and I'm just staring at it. And then at that moment, my eyes became more clear and I realized it was a pine cone. <laughs> and once I realized it was a pine cone. I zoomed out and I saw just the normal forest with its pine cones and this whole story and uh, the sausages went away, the, the, moth, the, the mafia smuggling sausages in the airplane, it all went away. And again, those little moments make you laugh. And then that's all I needed to wake up to finish the race. Oh, wow. I thank you. I, <laughs> my cheeks hurt. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> Oh, oh, just the image of the sausage mafia. <laughs> Love it. But maybe it's true. Maybe it's it true. could be. Maybe it could be true. <laughs> oh, wow. This episode of Fierce Planet Adventures podcast is brought to you by Five Mountain Coaching. Licensed, unbeatable mind coaching. Integrated, accelerated vertical growth across five domains of cutting-edge development. Designed by retired Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine. Learn the big four skills of mental toughness and resiliency. Discover the six pillars of performance. Test your mettle with custom-created crucibles across all five domains. Visit FiveMountainCoaching.com to schedule your free one-hour unbeatable mind coaching session. That's that's the number five, mountaincoaching.com. Begin your journey to becoming unbeatable today. So flow state, I wanted to get back to, uh, to that. Um, something I find very interesting. Um, I'm just finishing reading um, Stealing Fire. And they talk quite a bit about flow state and, and the different aspects. And I'm curious as, as to hear your, your description or your definition of flow state and and what that means when, when you help um, your clients through flow state or what it means to you when you've experienced it and how you teach it with your clients or how you train your clients. Sure. Big topic. Uh, 
it's a topic I'm passionate about. Uh, flow is, is this, uh, it's effortless perfection. In flow, time stops. In flow, you feel smart, you feel fast, you feel switched on. In flow, you tend to feel fulfilled, you tend to feel happy, or you just, your mind goes to the quiet place and you're just able to execute. Beautiful state. I think most people would like to be in it probably all the time. Probably like if we could pick to just flip the switch on and leave it on, like that would be the idea. And that's, this is a, one of the downsides of flow is you can't stay in that state all the time. And the more you can understand how the cycle of flow works, the better you can set yourself up to come into the cycle. You, you stack the odds in your favor and you can do things to help you get into it. Um, you can do things to help you move through each phase of the cycle and not get caught up and then fall out of the cycle. So when you start dissecting what the cycle looks like, you, you can play with different parts of it. And then you can also learn to respect it, that when flow comes out, you give yourself the moment to recover, to come back down, and then you start stacking things, uh, setting the table, making the situation happen to help you get back into flow. Uh, and some beautiful things can happen as well when you understand that um, flow can be transferred from one space to the other. And this is probably, I won't say probably, this is one reason uh, yeah, I love music. I love, I've had music in my life since I was a, a little kid. Um, I find that I can get into a flow state very easily with music. And I can use that feeling of flow from when I'm in it with music, I can transfer that over into other thinking. So if I'm writing or I need to do some, some kind of thought work behind the, the computer uh, and I'm not getting into that state, uh, I'm, I will likely go play guitar or some other musical instrument uh, and, and find my flow feeling there and use that and transfer it into that other space. Which is why often you know, people who run or work out, they can get into the flow state uh, as an athlete and then maybe they feel like they have a more productive day after that. So it, it, it is possible to create flow. You have things spinning and then you can use that to spin it into another area as an entry. It's like uh, getting on to the, the interstate. It's your entrance ramp. And it's about experimenting in your life for the ways you can get, get in and out of it and the ways that are more likely to get you into it. If you know you need to be writing, it's like, oh, I've got to do all this, this stuff. And, and you're not feeling it, trying harder is likely not going to work. And having get, gotten myself through several book projects, I know um, trying harder, I didn't get any of the books done. But doing other things, morning ritual, visualization, meditation, yoga, music, these kind of things would get me into the state where I could be a productive writer. That's a, it's, it's an hour long discussion, but these are some of the, the key pieces of it. Um, just to quickly like, mention, flow has to have struggle. This is the first, the first part of the flow cycle. There needs to be struggle, um, but the struggle has to be right at the right level where it's hard enough to challenge and push you and you know, get the heart rate up and, and uh, release adrenaline and, and get you engaged and attentive to what you're doing. But if it's too hard, if the level's too much, most people quit. So if the challenge is so far above what, what your capability at that moment is, uh, you, you would often this is the normal thing is you lose the whole cycle because it's just overwhelming. If it's too easy, it's not enough to get you engaged enough to get into that. So if, my, if I needed to run a four minute mile or five minute mile at this point, um, that's, I, I can't, I, this is not happening. So I don't have the training right now to run a five minute mile. So if that were the challenge, I would never get into flow running. But if it's right at that, if it's, it's, if it's whatever the number is for you, if it's running or whatever the task is, doable but hard, that's enough to make the struggle happen. And then you go from a struggle to a release. Something has to happen where you release it into flow. And there's things you can do to make release more likely. Uh, and then there's flow and then there's recovery. So understanding that cycle, experimenting with it. I wrote a whole book on this, helping runners and other athletes do some mind tricks, do some things and just 
reframe how they do training to make it more likely that they're going to get into the flow state. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> couple things. So I, I guess contextual, contextually, um, I, I guess what, I, what I'm asking for here, Jeff, is um, from, from your own life, from your own experience, um, from ultra marathons, um, Ironmans. What what what's your experience like with flow? And maybe maybe not you know graphically as to step by step of what that looked like, but I mean, was there a certain time, or has there been a certain time? when you're participating in these events where you just find yourself in a flow state or, or is it that you don't even realize you're there until you're, until you're out of the flow state? Yeah, I think, um, I shared a story earlier racing in the Sahara in the long, the double marathon stage. That was my peak flow experience in life at, to this point, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, this is when I, I still look back, the numbers don't make sense. Like I, the, not the, the speed that I ran that day in my life makes, it does not make sense, um, for everything I had done up until that point, um, and dealing with the heat and everything. So the moments like this, when everything comes together and you really do see that you exceeded expectations, um, these are moments when you realize that you were, you were in flow. Um, and in that moment, I think I, I knew something special was there, but I was so into visualizations of this, my friends being with me that I wasn't thinking, I'm in flow, don't lose mm -hmm. flow, this kind of thing. Um, more often, what you think of is the times you wish you were in it, and you weren't. And then you're like, well, if I were in flow, this would be easier. Now I'm going slow, and this sucks. Like, this is the, this is the normal dialogue that happens. But if you feed that, if you feed the, 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 the fear wolf, the, then you're going to go further down that hole. So these are the moments where, uh, and if I think back, I, I've had those, those low, low moments uh, in the middle of a race I've, where I've had to have a talk with myself and say, all right, which, which one are you going to feed? Which direction mm -hmm. are you going to go with this? Um, and you know, piece by piece, what you hope happens is that you can feed yourself the supportive positive energy, rely on your other mind training that you've done hopefully for weeks or months and, and dig yourself out of that. Um, in, if I look at the pattern, whether it's long distance sea kayaking or swimming, um, the moments of flow, are, I, I never looked at my watch. Like really, you, you, maybe I looked at nature, you know, it's, I, or I, I, I did a, a six hour swim a couple years ago uh, in a big lake and I was looking up at mountains that were 6,000 feet above the lake. And I was thinking that the lake was 300 feet below me to, at the bottom. And I think three hours passed and that's really all I thought about. It's like every time I was breathing, I was looking at the mountains and going, wow, that's so majestic. And then I would look down and think, wow, that's really deep. What's below me, this is amazing. Um, and those are the moments where you're so immersed in the moment and in the environment that you're not constantly looking at your time, looking at your time, what's my heart rate and that kind of thing. So time to me, that's what matters. It's the time. This is, this is where you feel so alive. And this is what you remember 10 years later. Not that you, your time was whatever the number is. Those, those goals can help create motivation. Um, I ran fast marathons. I've ran slow marathons. Um, one of my slowest marathons is my favorite one because I ran with my best friend and, 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 like that, I, this to me means so much more than getting whatever as a fast kind of time. Yeah, you know, the times I feel like I've actually been able to get into that flow state, there was always some sort of overcoming of fear or letting go of the fear of the ambiguity and just focusing on, yes, oh, wow, look where I am right now. Um, or to your point, singing a song in my head or, you know, a good tune that I can think of in those moments of real struggle or pain. It's, I also will turn the music often, just even if it's remembering a song in my head, but just getting yourself out of that mental chatter. And That's a great example of the release phase. You have, the fear is the struggle that, that you need it. It's the ticket to flow. It's got to be there. But then can, can, you, can you smile? Can you laugh? Can you think of music? Can you look at someone? Like if you can't have that moment of release, 
you can just get stuck in the struggle. And sometimes it's a silly song or it's, it's the simplest thing, like a bird flies over, what, but, but something that can be the, the release. And then that's usually when you slide in. And once you're in flow, you're not thinking about how do I get into flow? You're there. That's a beautiful thing. So from a coaching perspective, um, you know, I think you talk about the inner coach, um, the inner coach's voice, voices, you know, tr- voice for training. Um, and I, I guess I'm not quite clear on this. You know, um, bouncer guide. Um, how, how does that come into play with flow or does yeah, I'll, it? I'll get, yeah, it, it, it's um, not as much in flow, but as a general, as a general coaching guidance, I'll offer a, a short version of it. Um, most of us are familiar with the inner critic, like the voice that shows up and tell us we, it tells us we can't do something or today's not our day or work was too stressful or whatever. This, is, this, this, this voice is a master at finding out whatever it needs to, to, to unravel our mind and our trust and our confidence in ourselves. Um, we can also have a coach's voice and you can look at that as the, the contra, the opposite voice, you know, the one on the other shoulder. Uh, but what is that voice? And the best way I can uh, explain it is, is with an example. Um, when I first started coaching CrossFit 10 years ago or so, uh, the first session I coached, uh, one of my athletes was doing wall balls, throwing the medicine ball up on the, on the wall. So I thought I'm going to be a good coach and get in there with him. Right? So I, I grabbed a med ball and I'm down. And every squat, I'm looking at him saying, come on, man, you got this. And this goes on for 30 seconds and he throws his med ball down. Like, I think I'm giving him my heart. I'm giving him passion. I'm giving him a voice that I, that's my authentic coaching voice. And he throws a ball down and he's like, he's like, I know you mean well, but everything you're telling me right now is making this worse for me. And I was gutted. I was like, oh my God, I'm a terrible coach. I thought I, 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 was giving him everything I want as an athlete. And I realized in that moment that I needed different coaching voices. And as I matured as a coach, I realized the most important coach's voice as a coach is the one the athlete needs in that moment. It's not the one that you may be the the most comfortable with giving. He didn't need uh, a motivator. He didn't need the drill sergeant voice. This athlete wasn't gonna perform like that. Maybe he needed something whispered in his ear. Maybe he needed the phone just held up with a photo. Maybe he needed a cue, knees out. That's it. Maybe he needed nothing except a talk after the session. So later I realized as a, as a coach engaging directly with athletes, there needed to be different voices. There's different ways to achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And it needs to fit the athlete in the moment yourself, this works the same. If you just try to use one voice in your mind and it's, 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 it's not going to work in every situation. So I train athletes to practice the different types of voices they could need at different times. Sometimes you need someone to yell at you and tell you, get it done, one more push up, two more reps. Sometimes you need someone to tell you, you know, do this for your sister. It's a different voice. Sometimes you need someone to tell you, chest up, proud chest, just a, a technique cue, not, not a heart cue. So if you can start to understand the different voices that a coach would use with athletes, but then train this in your mind, use this in your visualizations, it's, it's like your superhero's utility belt. Uh, you practice this, you practice the different kinds of voices. So when you need it, you know what it's like to use the tool. I think a lot of our listeners are really going to resonate and connect with uh, the stories that you've shared. What, what's your, your favorite way to connect with, with folks? Um, social media, do you have a preferred platform? I think uh, if you want to show up at my house in Switzerland and go for a hike, that's probably my favorite way to connect with people. Nice. Um, and, and until that can happen, and, uh, then yeah, I, I've, social media, it, it's uh, I'm Hill Seeker on Instagram. Um, and I'm on the other social media uh, platforms, usually as Hill Seeker or Coach Jeff Grant. And uh, that's usually the best place to find me okay. other than in the mountains. Nice. Um, are there any topics we missed? Anything that you wanted to share that we didn't touch on? This was a lovely chat. I think we could probably just 
bounce ideas off of each other and share experiences uh, for another hour. And it would be great to talk about mountaineering and how we probably met each other at REI 21 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and it just took 20, 21 plus years for us to actually connect again. But uh, I think for this one, this was a good chat. Wonderful. Hillseeker.com, Jeff Grant. Thank you so much. Very grateful.